Good afternoon, everyone. We apologize for the delay, but I'm going to go ahead and call to order the Thursday, August 15th, 2024 Canvassing Board meeting. It is 1.52 p.m. being held here at our King County Elections Headquarters based in Renton, Washington. This is for the August 6th, 2024 primary election. I am canvassing board member Julie Wise, the King County Director of Elections, and with me serving on the canvassing board are members Kimberly Frederick, that is the Civil Chief Deputy in the Prosecuting Attorney's Office, and, the, um, and Stephanie Serkovich, who is the Chief of Staff to the King County Council, um, who will recuse herself from decisions related to the Commissioner of Public Lands race should there be any relevant item for discussion during this election. And she'll speak more to that in a moment. We are staffed today by Gerilyn Hampton, who is our King County Elections Ballot Processing Manager. This meeting is being live streamed via the King County Elections Facebook page and will be uploaded to YouTube after today's meeting. For our first item, Gerilyn Hampton will be providing an overview on the election then dive into our annual voter intent training. This board has done this training multiple, multiple times, so it will be a very quick review of the state voter intent manual, and then we'll review some ballots on their voter intent. Um, and just for a reminder, uh, we're gonna all speak loudly into the microphones, but please let us know, audience and staff members, um, if there's any issue in hearing us clearly. Thank you all for being here this afternoon. Gerilyn, please. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, first things first, we're going to our annual review of the voter intent guide. Folks in the audience, you may have a book in your hand as well. You can follow along. So the voter intent guide is created by our Secretary of State's office. It has rules, uh, along with great helpful features in there of exactly how to handle different types of marks we see on a ballot. So we're gonna review the book with us uh, right now. And Gerilyn, this is also for our audience that's uh, tuning in for our table of contents. You can see that there are rules relating to all kinds of things such as corrections, pattern of similar marks, uh, different types of write-ins, overvotes, and so on. Um, I just wanna point out rule S, anything else, rule S tells us if we don't have a rule in the book, we take it to the canvassing board and they get to make the final determination. So go ahead and jump to page two. We're going to talk about Rule A. Rule A tells us that any marks made inside the target area are going to be counted as valid votes. Any marks made outside of the target area shall also be valid only if they form a pattern of similar marks, and we'll talk about that in the next rule, Rule B, or if they're written instructions. Um, a specific rule here, though, is if the mark is a trace or an outline, like a oval trace around the uh, target area, they are not going to be valid votes unless it's a pattern of similar marks, and we'll talk about that in a second. But uh, just like when you learn English or grammar as a youth, they give you rules and give you a bunch of exceptions, so there's four exceptions here. Um, we'll talk about stray marks, hesitation marks, written notes, and corrections. If you jump to page three, you can see some examples. They show an X, a filled in target area, uh, a little check mark and a bigger check mark, all of those are valid votes. Is there a mark in the target area? Page four shows examples as well. The rectangle target area is just a different tabulation system that we use. Uh, page five is gonna show us uh, that sometimes following the rules can feel weird or uncomfortable, but the rule tells me that you have to have a mark in the oval um, for the target area to be a vote. So for example, on page five, only Teddy Roosevelt is a valid vote. Those other contests do not have a valid vote. Page six is a similar example, again, just a different uh, tabulation system. Teddy Roosevelt is the only valid vote on the example on page six. Jumping to page seven, all of these marks are valid votes. There's an actual phenomenon called voter fatigue. This is where um, the target area mark gets smaller and smaller as each contest um, is voted, but those are all valid votes um, as per the rules here. Page eight shows the same example of voter fatigue where the marks in the target area get smaller as the voters uh, continue down the ballot, still all valid votes. Page nine, the example 4A, um, the vote for Teddy Roosevelt is the valid vote. That oval trace is not considered a valid vote for the rules. And then for example, 4B, none of those are valid votes. 
because those are all just square traces, I guess, not oval traces. Uh, page 10, uh, we're talking about exception number one. Only the mark for Teddy Roosevelt and Rosa Parks are valid votes. There's a stray mark that just happens to go through Sacagawea, but stray marks are not considered valid votes for our exception to uh, rule A. Page 11 is another example of a stray mark, this time just a little bit larger. It does go through a, a rectangle, but it is not a valid vote. Uh, page 12 is showing us another exception here. None of these marks are valid votes. Um, in the following examples, there is a strike through, uh, through uh, the candidate's name that happens to go into the target area. Again, these are stray marks and not considered valid votes. Uh, and then page 13 is showing a different type of uh, exception. Uh, for example, 1A and 1B, Teddy Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt is the only valid vote here. Uh, the other mark is what we call a hesitation mark, and so that is not considered a vote. Page 14 is again showing an example of a hesitation mark. For this example, for 2A and 2B, there's a little bit more of a marking, but still considered a uh, hesitation mark because there is a different uh, target area that's completely filled in. Same thing with uh, page 15, examples 3A and 3B, another example for us uh, that are considered hesitation marks. Page 16 is showing an example where sometimes voters like to share their feelings um, on ballots or envelopes. In this example, some of the words go through the target area, but it's not an intentional vote, therefore no valid votes on that example. Same thing on page 17, same idea. All right, rule B is on page 18, and we'll take it um, paragraph by paragraph. Uh, the first paragraph tells us that marks made outside of the target area shall be counted as a valid vote as long as those marks form a pattern of similar marks. All races and issues with that um, mark uh, must be the same pattern for them to be considered votes. So that uh, point being, it doesn't matter uh, if it's a big check mark, a small check mark, the type of mark, for that example, a check mark, they're all check marks, all valid votes. Uh, second paragraph, marks made outside the target area may be counted as valid votes even if there's one pattern used on one page, like the front of the ballot, or a different pattern used on the back of the ballot or another page of the ballot. So you could have check marks on the front and X's on the back. Um, a pattern on either side is okay at all valid votes. Third paragraph, marks made outside the target area shall be counted as valid votes if one pattern of similar marks is used for measures and another or different pattern used for candidate races. Um, still okay and considered valid votes. Next paragraph, if some of those marks are in the target area and some are not, but it's the same type of mark, all of those marks shall be counted as valid votes. Next paragraph, if the marks strike through the candidate names or ballot measure responses in a pattern of similar marks throughout the ballot, all such marks shall be counted as valid votes. And then finally, a mark outside the target area on the ballot that contains only one race or measure is not required to form a pattern. That's a weird sentence. They just mean you can have a pattern of one if it's the only um, time someone tries to mark on the ballot. Page 19 shows us some examples. Um, on page 19, we have check marks as an example. None of them are in the target area, but because it's a pattern of similar marks, those are all valid votes. We can tell which uh, response that check mark is attached to. Page 20 is showing all valid votes because in this example, they use circles as their type of mark. Page 21 shows X's. Some of the X's are in the target area, some are outside the target area, but the fact that they are all X's as the mark means those are all valid votes. Page 22, similar again, uh, using check marks as the example, those are all valid votes, even though two of them go in the target area, two of them are outside the target area. Uh, page 23 is showing us a variety of marks, but for page 23, the voter added themselves and sh has shown us that they can fill in the oval, they know how to vote. So Thoroughbred Marshall is the only valid vote. Those other marks, the check mark and circles, are not a pattern of similar marks, those, therefore those are not valid votes. Page 24 is the same type of example. The only valid vote there is Thoroughbred Marshall. Those check marks is not a complete pattern, so not valid. Um, pattern. 
Page 25 is showing as an example where they used check marks on the front of the ballot for one page and then they filled in the ovals completely on the back of the ballot. Um, so all of those marks are valid votes. Page 26 is giving us an example where there are circles used for measure responses and then underlines used for candidate uh, responses. Um, those are all valid votes. All right. We're still on rule B, and this is the part where we're talking about one mark on a ballot. So when a voter returns a ballot, having marked only one thing, one race or measure, it's the mere act of returning a ballot that indicates the voter wants to make their voice heard. So because you can't establish a pattern when a voter marks only one race or measure, um, must be con all those marks must be considered a vote if we can in, uh, determine their voter intent. So we're gonna see a series of examples of the types of marks a voter might make on page 29, we see an underline, a circle, example 1C looks like the voter signed their selection, even example 1D where they filled in the target area and crossed out the yes, those are all considered valid votes if it's the only mark they made on their ballot. Page 30 shows additional examples, someone wrote approved next to the approved, they gave an arrow, even a circle connecting the response to the target area, all valid votes if it's the only thing they do on their ballot. Page 31 continues to show someone writing yes next to one of the responses and X next to a response, putting a line through it. Again, if it's the only thing they do on the ballot, that's a valid vote. And page 32 is showing, uh, each example shows one mark on a ballot and it's a valid vote. So even though it might look like a correction, if it's the only thing they do on the ballot, it's going to be a valid vote. Um, page 33 is showing an example of a large ballot with lots of contests on there. Um, however, they only mark one contest. That is a valid vote, even though it's a circle. Page 34, Rule C, talking about corrections. If the voter has followed the instructions for correcting a vote, the stricken vote shall not be counted. If a second choice is marked, it shall be counted as a valid vote. If a second choice is not marked, the rate shall be considered under vote. So correct it away to an under vote. If the voter has marked two target areas and put an X or a slash, like half an X, over one of the marked areas, the choice without the X or a slash, half an X, um, shall be counted as a valid vote. Page 35 shows us a couple examples of voters following the instructions as we put on our ballot, where we want someone to line through the selection they don't want. Um, the valid votes here are William Henry Harrison, the one without the line through it. On page 36, each of these examples shows a correction. These marks are not valid votes unless the voter marked only one race or measure on the ballot. So for example, 2A and 2B, these are examples from different ballots. The voter followed the instructions for making a correction. If the voter marked a line through every race on the ballot or only one thing on the ballot, those would be votes. But if they do this amongst other normally filled out target areas, these are corrections to an under vote. Page 37 shows uh, an example of making a correction using an X instead of a slash. So the target area that does not have the X on it will be the valid vote. And page 38 shows using half of an X or a slash as your correction method. So therefore the vote for Abigail Adams is the valid vote for those two examples. All right, page 40. Rule D talks about what is not a correction. So if the voter has both marked the choice correctly and also placed an X in the same target area, but has not marked the second target area, it's going to be a valid vote. And we see a lot of voters filling in a target area and just putting an X on top, that's a valid vote if there's not another target area filled in. Um, changes made by the voter to wording printed on the ballot will not invalidate the votes cast for that race. Sometimes people add their feelings or commentary to a bond or levy, it doesn't change whether or not that vote is cast or the content of that bond or levy. Uh, page 41 uh, shows us examples from different ballots that are valid for William Henry Harrison. So for all four of those examples from different ballots, they use either an X, a half an X, or a slash. Because they did not fill in a second target area, that's a valid vote for William Henry Harrison. All right, rule D, the following ballot contains
campaigns, a valid vote and voter proposition. They filled in that target area for yes, they didn't fill in anything else, so that's a valid vote. And then we simply ignore when people line out parts of um, ballot language. It doesn't change the content of the actual uh, measure. If we jump to page 44, we're gonna learn about rule E and written instructions. So if the voter has attempted to vote, or correct a vote by providing us some sort of written instructions regarding their intent, it shall be counted as the voter instructs us to. Written instructions can and do include words, circles, lines, or arrows. So if you look at page 45, we see some examples here. Uh, the vote for Abigail Adams is the valid vote for all of these examples. So you can see someone using a circle, sometimes they put no or yes next to something, or Nice voters will say this one with a clear arrow telling us exactly where they want us to vote. You may or may not see some examples of written instructions today. Uh, page 46, rule F, talking about identifying marks. Uh, marks identifying the voters, such as initials, signatures, or addresses, do not disqualify a ballot. Or page 47 just shows a voter putting their name on the ballot and just ignore it. Page 48 shows an example of uh, someone making a correction and initialing it, initialing it their correction, we just ignore that. Page 49 shows an example of an address label for a voter being on their ballot. Again, we would just ignore it. It doesn't uh, impact the votes on the ballot. Rule G is on page 50, and that's talking about overvotes. So race, races or issues that have more target areas marked than are allowed are considered overvotes. So for us here in Washington State, or King County, it is one, you can vote for one only. Um, if there are more than one target area filled in in a contest, no votes shall be counted for the response, but we do account for the overvotes in their own bucket. So we know how many overvotes we have for any contest. Uh, there is a, an exception to Rule G. If there's a write-in for a candidate that's already printed on the ballot, we will give that vote to the candidate. Uh, page 51, these are not valid votes for any candidate. The following examples from different ballots show more than one target area marked than are allowed. They are tallied as overvotes and not votes for either of those candidates. But again, we do keep track of how many overvotes we have for any given contest. Page 52 talks about rule H, which is when there's a write-in and a blank target area. So if a name is written on a write-in line, it shall be counted as a valid write-in vote, regardless of whether the corresponding target area is marked or not. So essentially, it's the act of writing on the line that turns it into a write-in vote. It doesn't matter if anything is um, filled in in that target area or not. So on page 40, sorry, 53, it shows a bunch of examples for Rosa Parks. In some of the examples, the target area is filled in, and some of the examples are not. Those are all still valid write-in votes. Rule I on page 54 is talking about a write-in that's already on the ballot. So if the name of a candidate who's already printed on the ballot is written in, that vote shall not be considered an overvote. Again, it's gonna be a vote for the printed candidate. And same rule applies, it doesn't matter if the write-in target area is filled in or not. So on page 55, we see some examples of Abigail Adams with some slight name variations. A couple of these examples don't have the target area filled in, but a couple do. Um, but there is a printed candidate on this ballot named Abigail Adams, so for all four of these examples, Abigail Adams gets that vote, and these are not considered overvotes. Rule J on page 56 talks about name variations. So if a write-in vote is cast for a declared write-in candidate using a commonly recognizable nickname or spelling variation, uh, we're gonna give that vote um, to the candidate. So on page 57, there's a declared writing candidate named Thomas Smith. You can see these four different examples have a variety of spellings for Thomas Smith. We would give all of these votes to declared writing candidate Thomas Smith. Page 58, rule K, uh, tells us essentially filling in the target area does not make it a write-in. You have to take the action of writing on the line to make it a write-in vote. So all of the, those examples on page 59, um, none of those are write-ins. We're going to write on the line. And you'll see some good writing ones on the ballots you get to see today. Uh, page 60, rule L. 
The candidate's target area is marked, and the write-in target area is marked, but no name is written in on the line. It shall not be tallied as an overvote, but it's gonna be a vote for the printed candidate. Again, filling in that target area doesn't make it a write-in unless there's write-in on the line. So for all of these examples, on page 61, the printed candidate gets the vote. Those are all William, William Henry Harrison votes. Page 62, uh, name combination. So rule M tells us if a write-in vote were, is cast for a candidate with a combination of names already on the ballot, it shall not be counted as a vote for either of the printed candidates. Instead, it's gonna be counted as a valid write-in vote for the name as it's written. So on page 60, 63, we see a couple examples where there's a combination of the Teddy Roosevelt name and the Abigail Adams name. Um, someone wrote on the line, Teddy Adams, we're not giving the vote to either Teddy or Abigail. It's a write-in vote for Teddy Adams. Page 64, rule N. If a candidate's target area is marked, the write-in target area is also marked, and something other than that candidate's name is written in on the write-in response area, it shall be counted as an overvote and not a valid vote for any candidate. If a candidate's target area is marked, and the write-in target area is not marked, it shall be counted as a valid vote for the marked candidate. And my favorite part here, if the voter intent cannot be ascertained, the ballot shall be referred to the canvassing board for review. All the hard ones come here. Uh, so some examples on page 65 are showing us sort of three actions taking place, therefore turning it into an overvote. The first action is filling in the target area for a printed candidate, the second action is filling in the target area for the write-in bubble. The third action is writing something on that write-in line. Three actions turn it into an overvote. So three strikes and you're out. And this is true in the example 1C, even though the write-in says nobody, it doesn't matter, it's just the action of writing on the line. Page 66 tells us, this is a little bit different now, so the following marks on this page are considered valid votes for the printed candidate, Abigail Adams, there's only two of the three possible actions that are happening because there's only one action, right? They filled in the target area for the printed candidate. They wrote on the line, that's two actions. They didn't take the third action, so it's gonna be a valid vote for the printed candidate, not considered an overvote for this example on rule N. Page 68, rule O, uh, when a write-in is not eligible. So a write-in vote for a race not appearing on the voter's ballot shall not be counted. There's always an exception though. Exception is provisional ballots. Um, we're gonna skip the piece about provisional ballots because we're not going to deal with any of those. Um, page 69 shows us uh, a lot of people have feelings on what happens in Seattle. Uh, they wrote Seattle Monorail, yes, no way. Um, but they're not eligible to vote for a city of Seattle Monorail so that write-in vote would not be counted. It's not on their ballot. Page 70, Rule P, tells us though that a write-in vote for a race appearing somewhere else on the ballot, it's gonna be counted as a valid vote as long as everything else, all of the requirements are fulfilled and the office, position number, and political party, if that's applicable, are clearly indicated. So on page 71, you can see that that first contest on the example ballot, State Representative District 14, position one, looks like the voter marked a selection, marked another selection, they made couple corrections, they wanted to make it clear for us, they gave us all the information, they wrote out the position of the contest and the candidate so that we could count this because they are eligible for this contest, it's on their ballot. That would be a valid vote. Rule Q, messy marks. When a messy mark goes into a area partially outside of its own response area, it's still gonna be considered a valid vote. If most of the mark is in the target area and intent can easily be discerned, Page 73 shows three different types of messy marks, different types of examples where part of the mark goes into another target area. Page 74, rule R, it's about pattern of partisan voting. Voter intent for any single contest shall not be determined based on a pattern of partisan voting on the ballot. Page 75, rule S, my favorite rule. Voter intent on questionable marks not covered in the rules of this manual are going to be taken to the canvassing board to make a determination. So if we see anything outside of this book, we bring it to you. All right, Woo. good job you guys.
That's why we are here. Yes. <laughs> you Thank you, Gerald. Fabulous <laughs> review of the voter intent manual. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to move on and review actual voter intent ballots. Please. Okay. And before we do that, I'm just going to uh, make an announcement. As Julie said, I'm going to be recusing myself from uh, the voter intent discussions for the state uh, public lands commissioner race. That's because uh, I report to one of the candidates in my job. I'm the chief of staff for the King County Council and uh, council person Dave Up the Grove is my boss. And so he is competing in that race. And so I'm not gonna be um, participating in, in those discussions. All right, first item we have today is B-0001. One item on the front. Okay, for U.S. Senator, is the vote for is the vote for Paul a correction? Even though the line doesn't touch the candidate name or go into the candidate name, we just talked about corrections. Uh, should we treat it like a slash, or is this an overvote, meaning this is not a correction? So the instructions how to correct a mistake is to make a correction draw a line through the entire choice, you then have the option of making a different choice by completely filling in another okay. Yes, and you can find rules about corrections in some examples on page 34. Paragraph one talks about a correction. Paragraph three talks about if we want to call a correction a slash. I always say half an X or a slash. You can make a correction to the next a slash. And in our internal working with corrections, generally if the line gets to the candidate, like gets on the candidate name at all, we're calling that a correction. This is a, it's a close. Um, all of the other ovals on the ballot are clearly filled in, um, and this looks to me like it's a correction on that. I agree with that. It, it's a clear kind of strike through of the, of the oval. The board has determined for this ballot it is a valid vote for um, United States Senator Maria Cantwell. B-0002, we've got one item on the front. So for Congressional District number eight, is the vote for Carmen a correction, even though the line does not touch the candidate name at all? Um, again, Rule C talks about corrections on page 34, paragraph one. Same idea, can we, it looks like there's a little circle put in the middle and a little line through it. To me, it looks like the same as the other one. Um, based on the pattern on the entire ballot, it looks like the intended vote is for the circle that's filled in, and the other one is a correction. Thank you. The board has determined for United States Representative Congressional District Number Eight a vote for Schreier. Next item B 0003. Got three items on the back. Okay, we'll take it one by one. We'll take this side first. All right, 
right, so superintendent of public instruction. We also have one for insurance commissioner up at the top. And then Supreme Court Justice number two down here. Is the squiggly mark throughout all of the ovals meant to be an overvote, or do we think it's meant to be an undervote? Um, specifically for the insurance commissioner one up here, there is a mark in Patty that is much darker than the rest of the mark, uh, and similar to the mark in commissioner of public lands over here, and that's like a little Um, is that a vote despite the rest of this mark is our question, and we don't have a written rule to point to for this one. There's a bunch of squiggles. My thought is in the insurance commissioner race because that mark is clearly darker and it matches um, marks that are made elsewhere on the ballot that are clear votes for a person, that that is a vote for Patty Cooper. Um, I think this is, uh, I don't know if it's an undervote or an overvote with all the squiggles through everything that's, I sort of split on those. I feel like, you know, if we use how people generally use cross-outs and make other instructions, that it's intended as maybe an undervote to cross everybody out. Um, and then I agree that the mark on Jamie Herrera Butler and the Commissioner of Public Lands and the vote for Patty Kerber and the Insurance Commissioner, they're consistent and they look like those are votes for those actual candidates. And the intention is to cross everything else out. The board has determined an undervote for superintendent of public instruction, a vote for Patty Cooter under insurance commissioner, and an undervote for state Supreme Court justice position number two. Okay, B-0004, there's one item on the front. Uh, in the governor contest. Oh wait, hold on. Oh, okay, so the whole ballot is marked with X's. Uh, X here, X here, X here. Uh, except where the Dave oval is X'd, but then it's scribbled out. Is this scribble out over the X a correction or the equivalent of an X or a slash? Again, looking at corrections. Look, you can see there's like an X under it. It looks to me like the X is the vote and that the other one is a correction. I agree. The board has determined on this ballot, governor, a vote for Bob Ferguson. Next item is B-0005. marks would ordinarily be clear votes, such as Congressional 7 and State Auditor, State Auditor, 
Some would be clear scratch outs, such as insurance commissioner, uh, Seattle Council 8, Eight, and some resemble corrections, such as Secretary of State, Ledge 43, Representative 2, but there's no clear dividing line. How do we count these votes? Uh, so Rule A, exception number one, has examples uh, 2A and 2B for scratch outs. <coughs> on page 12. And then there's examples on page 34 if we're talking about correction. So we're looking for a direction on everything but the governor contest on this ballot. <laughs> Of course, the board is saying that for United States Senator, under vote. United States Rep, Congressional, seven, is a vote for Jaya Paul. Lieutenant Governor, Lieutenant Governor is an under vote. State is an undervote. State Treasurer. State Treasurer, undervote. State Auditor, vote for Pat McCarthy. Attorney General, a vote for Nick Brown. Commissioner of Public Lands, under vote. Superintendent of Public Instruction, under vote. Insurance Commissioner, under vote. Ledge 43, position one, under vote. Position two, under vote. State Supreme Court, position two, under vote. City of Seattle, position eight, under vote. All right, on to B-0006, 
One item on the back. Okay, so legislative district number 46, uh, rep position number two. Does the slash through the entire contest negate that vote for Daria underneath? Um, so rule E, written instructions, is on page 44. There are these other contests where they put a strike through, but they, or I'm sorry, a slash, but they didn't put a vote. Some contests have a vote, but no slash through it. This one is unique in that it has a slash and also uh, a target area is filled in. I mean, it looks clear that um, there are certain races where they're not making any decisions, and then this race, they have something filled in, so it looks like they made the intent of, I, I think it looks like a correction, where they're not, they're not voting for this second. They're not voting for anyone. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I agree. The board has determined for legislative district number 46, representative position number two, an undervote. All right, we're on to B-0007. We have the entire back, and all but one, all but, all but lieutenant governor on the front. Does the X across each side of the ballot negate all of these votes? That's easy to find. There's a big X here. Um, some of the contests don't have votes, some have none on the right in line, but a big X across, and then on the back, another big X across the whole ballot. Some of the contests have votes, some of them have that none in the right in line. Or any or none, or are there votes on this ballot? And I mean, there is some limited sort of instruction. determined that every race on the ballot is an undervote. Dash 
0008. There's a couple items on the back of the ballot. State Auditor and Seattle Council District 8. Uh, what are these votes? Uh, this is really looking at messy marks on page 72. So there's a mark that goes a little bit into two of the candidates for auditor. Uh, same with uh, City Council position number 8 in Seattle. Ballot votes marked in a target area partially extend into the response area, it shall be counted as a vote if most of the mark is in the target area and intent can be discerned. Yes. Is there more in one than the other? <laughs> yes. I forgot that before. Or is it equally in the middle, in which case there's not a rule and you get to decide if it's more in one than the other? Touching one, not touching the other? tend to have a hard time when it's so in the middle of really being able to, to decide, you know, I mean, unless it's clearly um, more in one oval than the other, and these are pretty close in the middle. The target of any one, I didn't see any in the other one. Is it, is it the one on the right? It's underneath the oval of Tanya Wu, and there are a few little stray wispy marks inside the oval, but barely for Sonatina Sanchez. And so I think for both of these, for me personally, I would have a harder time. That one I would have a hard time determining which one. And then for Matt Hawkins versus Pat McCarthy, there are like just enough little stray marks in each oval. It's just so hard to tell. To me, it looks like an overvote for the auditor race, and it looks like there are there's marks inside of the target area for one of the people in the city race. That's what it looks like to me. That we have marks in the target area. Meaning they're equally in two target areas so for this one. For this one. Mm -hmm. And it looks like we're going on marks within the target area that vote for that person for that one. And I see this more as somebody who started their mark kind of smack in the middle because it's darkest there, and then there's a little bit of a stray, like I said, kind of a wisp going down into the other. It doesn't look like they intended, you know, they didn't start with that dress, you know, that mark. And so I, that's why I'm struggling with counting that as a vote where it's just kind of a wispy little, you know, they, they started it up higher. But it does say rule A says any marks made in the target area shall be counted as valid votes. So that's why I feel like for, for the, um, the city of Seattle Right, so whether or not I can determine the intent because they, whether they intended to or not, they marked in that oval area and you're saying that the rule is that they marked in that area so that's where the vote should be counted. It's on page um, 44. Oh, actually that's not true. I didn't turn the page. It's on page uh, two. Page two? Yes. It's that first sentence. Board has determined for state auditor overvote. City of Seattle position eight, 
a vote for Sanchez. B-0009, there's uh, one item on the front. Uh, Congressional District Number 8, what is the vote? Again, we're in the messy mark section of this pile of ballots. in Kim Schreier and a little bit more in Carmen. Uh, it's in both. Board has determined for United States Representative Congressional District Member 8 an overvote. B-0010, we've got a single item on the front. Lieutenant Governor, here, what is this vote? This is a great ink blot, blob. Um, yeah, it's kind of the same thing. We have some in Bob Hagman's oval, a little bit more in Dan Matthews' oval, but it's in both. The board has determined for Lieutenant Governor over vote. B-0011, a single item on the front in the governor contest. Again, with the messy mark. into the oval of Bob Ferguson, it's sort of on the line. Um, so if we're looking at a mark made in the oval, it would be Ricky Anthony. Ward has determined for governor a vote for Ricky Anthony. Item B-0012, there's a single item on the front. U.S. Senator, what is this vote? Again, with the messy marks. Board has determined for United States Senator overvote. B-0013, a single item on the back of the ballot for a superintendent of public instructions.
Oh, the public instruction. Oh, sorry. I thought it was public land, so I was like, <laughs> oh, I don't have to worry about this one. <laughs> yeah, but it is, yeah, it's, it's in neither. The market's really in neither, and there's just a, like a wisp of a stray mark in the um, Chris Wright doll. Board is determined for superintendent of public instruction under vote. B-0014, there's one item on the front in the governor contest. entirely in between the two except for one swoop down into the Bob Ferguson bubble, but it's very negligible. The board has determined for governor under vote. B-0015 there's one item on the front and one on the back. So for governor on the front and then it's insurance commissioner on the back and it's messy marks again. So that's the front, and I'll show the back. the front, the governor race, there is more marking in Jim Daniels' bubble than there's really nothing in Cassandra's bubble. And on the back, there's really no marking in Bill Boyd's bubble, but yes, plenty of marking in John Pestinger's bubble. And I'm looking at messy marks. When otherwise valid votes marked in the target area partially extend into the response area, it shall be counted as a vote if most of the mark is in the target area. If most of the mark is in the target area, an intent can easily be discerned. I think a lot of the mark uh, on the back, th this one's the easier one for me because there's more in John Pestinger's bubble. So that would be an easier call for me. The front is a little more, um, a little more difficult. Just given the shape of all of the other ones, um, I agree that the, the vote for the insurance commissioner looks like John Pestinger, and similarly. determined for governor, I vote for Jim Daniel with ink in the oval. 
an insurance commissioner a vote for um, John Pessinger. Or determined for Lieutenant Governor over a vote. B-0017, there's one item on the front and one on the back. Uh, for Governor, is the Mark or Jeff here a, a correction? on the page, however, it's not going into the target area at all. Governor race, it it sort of looks like this same same thing. So that would be an over vote for that. Um, the one on the back is a little trickier. It's a consistent shape to the votes, the other votes. Yeah. There's only one shape. Yeah. So that would lend itself to a vote for. Board has determined for governor an overvote and for state auditor a vote for Pat McCarthy. Zero zero one eight. Two items on the back. For legislative district number 32, representative position number two, is the mark to the left of Junia, this one, a vote for Junia. The marks on this page aren't very similar to the other marks that they've used, uh, except for the fact that it's not very blue. Uh, and then for justice position number two, is this mark a vote for Todd? even though it's mostly between the ovals. Uh, it kind of looks like writing a little bit. Um, and should we disregard that as a written note for something?
candidate for Dunya. Oh, that's not no, no. The that Todd. looked like yes for Todd, and then the other one looked possibly like an overvote. You really or an undervote. You you really can't determine who they're voting for. I didn't see anything in the target area. It's all outside of the target area. It isn't in the target area, but I do think it looks similar to some of these other marks. Like I do think that there are some similarities. In line with that. Um. No, I see what you're saying. It looks like there's kind of outlining the oval for uh, Dunya. It's almost like a parenthetical, they have sort of a parent parentheses type of marking that they're doing on the whole ballot, which is why um, they just didn't make it, if they would have made it a little more to the right, it would have been in that oval. Page 18 talks about similar marks. similar marks, right, then if it's a pattern of similar marks through the whole ballot, or one side of the ballot, or for candidates, or measures, then it's considered a pattern. But it has to be all a subsection. To me, it looks like a vote for Tom Thielen for the Supreme Court, and then for the legislative district number 32, it to me, it looks like an not really a pattern throughout the whole page. Um, the other the other votes are in the target area. This one's folded out outside of the target area. If it is the same type of mark and you feel like it's the same type of mark, it doesn't have to all be in. It can be in or out of the target area if it's the same type. So just because it's not, like I said, if they were just aimed a little more to the right, it would have been squarely in the target area for Dunya. And I do feel like, you know, just looking at the way these marks were made, that they're similar. I mean, they're not um, the neatest, so it's hard to tell when it's a little bit, but, you know. That would be the solution. Yeah. Is Port comfortable with a vote for Dunya and a vote for Todd? Legislative District Number 32, Position 2, vote for Junia, vote State Supreme Court, Position 2, vote for Todd. B-0019, there's an item on the front and many on the back. Okay, Congressional Number 7 here. Superintendent of Public Instruction, a messy market question. 
and then a separate grouping um, state treasurer here. Legislative district number four, rep one here, I'm sorry, rep one and rep two here. These marks aren't in the ovals. Are they even votes at all? And that would be that pattern of similar marks type of question where if it's pattern similar marks, it doesn't have to be in the oval, and you can tell which response it's connected to. So Any messy marks or pattern of similar marks? And for the state auditor race, you counted for pack, that mark for pack? Yes, because there's our, our general rule is if it's uh, touching or in an oval, that's going to be who that vote goes to. If it's completely in the middle, then we'll come asking not more or less than one or the other or obvious to us in actually. me the, the easiest one the reason I asked about the state auditor race was because for this treasurer race it seemed like very similar like even though the mark again it's not in the oval but it's right there next to the oval and it seems like a very strong mark for that candidate I agree I agree okay so that one that one's an easier one board has determined a vote for state treasurer for Hammock Representative Congressional District Number Seven. Um, the mark is for Dan Alexander. I'm not looking at. Um, and then, similarly in this one, there's a mark inside the oval for Gail Whitaker. Um, and here for this one, it looks like the vote is for Kimberly McLeod. It's on the name, and it's similar to what you have here over here. And then this one looks like. The board has determined votes for United States Representative Congressional District Number Seven. A vote for Dan Alexander, Secretary of State Dale Whitaker, Superintendent of Public Instruction Chris Reichel, Legislative District Number 34, Position 1, Kimberly Cloud. And for Legislative District Number 34, Position Number 2, Lansdowne. Or was that an undervote? That was the uh, undervote, right? Yes. Undervote. Auditor, uh, Commissioner of Public Lands. These marks aren't in the ovals. Are they votes due to being a pattern of similar marks? If so, who gets the vote in this instance? Oh, and also, Legislative District 43, position number two.
so it to me looks like there's a clear pattern when I'm looking at the city treasurer. Um, they built above the target area for their intended build. So to me, it looks like they are voting for the candidate underneath the mark as they did in this clear vote for city treasurer. <coughs> would agree I'm not weighing in on the Commissioner of Public Lands uh, and I just um, I guess I'm not as sure with the governor race but to me it looks like there's a consistent pattern of voting directly above the candidate so I would I would count the vote of the name underneath the mark because I, that looks like the consistent pattern on this ballot right. I would feel comfortable with that Carolyn, is the team not having us weigh in on the state Supreme Court justice position number two? This was counted for David. There's more of it in the oval, all over the, it's like all on the line and in it. So that would be a vote for David. Okay. Board has determined votes for state auditor Matt Hawkins, uh, commissioner of public lands, Peterson, Ledge 43, position two, Scott. Um, for Governor Grant. as well as state treasurer, state auditor, insurance commissioner, legislative district number 46, uh, rep position number one, and then also uh, Seattle City Council uh, position number eight. Some of the messy marks have X's inside the ovals. Are those X's meant to correct that part of the messy mark, leaving the other part as a vote? That's our question.
X's underneath, but it seems like. Yeah, sometimes there's an X that the person you're voting with, sometimes it's an oval. So it's really hard to determine in one that has an X and an oval right. what the intent is. And it looks like even like a vote that has already been counted, the Commissioner of Public Lands, there's an X kind of yes. marking on top of it. So yes. You know, that could be like a uh, U.S. Congressional District Number 7. Board has determined that United, <clears throat> United States Senator, overvote. State Treasurer, overvote. State Auditor, overvote. Insurance Commissioner, overvote. Ledge 46, position one, overvote. City of Seattle, position eight, overvote. B-0022, single item on the back. Messy mark has a line through part of it here. Is that line meant to correct away a part of the blob um, in Manka? See also the little line next to the right of Nick. Um, it's next to the first party part of Nick's response. Is that a written instruction, either that Nick is the vote or to correct away the part of the mark that goes into the Nick Oval? Um, through Manka Dingra, is that the? Yes, and it looks like it, a correction to vote for Brown because she, the, the, um, her name is crossed. Right. It's, it's, it's actually the top. The top. And so but I can see how that would look like. She still messes up. Um, yes, that's not and it's not really evident from other markings. has determined a vote for Nick Brown for Attorney General. It's 
so messy and it goes through three different, you know, I don't even think it's crossing out four. I mean, it's crossing out prefers Democratic Party in the name above. So I don't think I could, I would say this is an overvote, right? Thanks. Board has determined United States Senator overvote. B-0024, we've got a single item on the front. For U.S. Senator, this messy mark has a slash through part of it. Is that line meant to correct away the Maria part of the messy mark? Uh, let's see, see also the little line to the right. of the Maria Oval, is that a written instruction either that Maria is the vote or to, to correct away the part of the mark in Maria? definitely more marking in the Maria Cantwell bubble than the Chuck Jackson bubble. And we just talked about a mark to the right um, being an indication of maybe that was the intended, um, the intended candidate. So I wonder if for consistency, I would say that the vote is for Maria Cantwell. Yeah, there's definitely more in there. And it's, there's nothing indicating that they're crossing out Board has determined United States Senator vote for Maria Cantwell. B-0025, it's an item on the back. For Seattle City Council, position number eight. Here. Uh, so this contest is on the back of the ballot. However, on the front of the ballot, uh, the vote for Denny, a lieutenant governor, bled through to the back of the ballot next to the Seattle City Council position number eight. So there's a vote here that bled through to the other side. It appears that the voter tried to scribble out bleed mark through, but that scribble slopped into the Tanya Oval. If that's what happened, Tanya shouldn't count as a vote, and the vote would be for Saul. But it wasn't overly explicit or clear, so we want your guidance. I agree that it looks like they're trying to correct the splotch from the other side, and that the vote is for Saul. I agree. Board has determined City of Seattle Council position number eight, a vote for Saul. B-0026, it's an entire ballot situation. Uh, so whole ballot. This voter has written the same thing on each write-in line. We're guessing it might be a signature. Uh, sometimes the write-in line is bubbled, sometimes it is not bubbled. Here's an example of bubbled down here, not bubbled. Um, can we call this a pattern of similar marks per rule B, even though sometimes it's bubbled and sometimes it's not, and give them their non-write-in votes? Rule B generally is used to vote with marks outside the oval, so this would be a somewhat unusual application of the rule, um, but in all of these instances, there is a non-write-in signature, like a printed candidate is also voting on these. So this is the front, as you can see, we'll look at the back. Similar in that there's always the same writing on that right in line. There's a vote for a candidate. 
sometimes the writing bubble is built in, but not every single time. Although it is on the back. And what's the write-in? Uh, there's sort of three things. You said there are three things that need to be in yes. place for a write-in. Yes, so if those three actions happen, it's usually a overvote situation. Mm -hmm. But because they're writing the same thing on every line, and it could be a voter signature, we were wondering if that's a pattern, pattern of similar marks, right. in which case the printed candidate would get the vote instead of all being both overvotes, in which case nothing. This is not a name of any kind. If it is, it's a signature or something. It's not a name of a candidate. It's the same thing over and over again. To me, the fact that they, there's only one um, for the majority of the of the ballot, there's a clear selection. It looks like a pattern of similar marks. To me, a signature of some sort to kind of verify that that is their choice. Right. I agree. Board has made a determination. United States Senator Jackson. United States Representative Congressional 7 Halleck, Governor DePaula, Lieutenant Governor Griffin, Secretary of State Tiggs, Treasurer Hannock, Auditor McCarthy, Attorney General Sorano, Commissioner of Public Lands DePoe, Superintendent of Public Instruction, Reichdahl. Insurance Commissioner, Hendricks. Ledge 33, Position 1, Richter. Position 2, Esmond. State Supreme Court, Position 2, Shelby. determined ballot votes for Senator Graham, Representative Congressional District 7, Alexander, Governor Daniel, Lieutenant Governor Harmon, Secretary of State Tig, State Treasurer Pellicciotti, Auditor Hawkins, Attorney General Serrano, Public Lands Lebovitz, Public Instruction, Saris, Insurance Commissioner, Cooter, Ledge 33, Position 1, Richter, Ledge 33, Position 2, Gregerson, State Supreme Court, Position 2, Bloom. B-0028, we've got a single item on the front and a single item on the back. for a U.S. Senator, and then Justice Position Number Two, this one. These are both messy mark situations. So if we go back to Senator, the mark for Senator is mostly in Maria here, but there's a circle around David, around the oval here, with an arrow pointing back down to Maria, Maybe with initials and a date. Is that a written instruction to vote for Maria? And then the other one's just a messy mark. So 
but to me it looks like it's a from Maria and a vote from David. Senator, vote for Cantwell. State Supreme Court position to vote for Shelby. B-0029, a single item on the front. negating the vote for David because the no has determined Lieutenant Governor a vote for Denny Heck. B-0030, three items on the back. So for Legislative District Number 11, Senator Ledge 11, Representative Number 1, and Ledge 11, Representative number two, are these question marks, write-in votes that turn this situation into an overvote because those three actions have happened, a vote for a candidate, filling in the write-in line, and then writing on the line. Uh, and then just a note that write-ins don't have to be named per se, the internal standard we use is if there's writing on the line, it's a write-in. has determined for Ledge 11, State Senator Overvote. Position 1, Overvote. Position 2, Overvote.
general. The mark in peat up here is barely in the oval. If it was by itself, we'd count it as a vote. But should this mark in peat cause an overvote with the peat and ink selection? has determined for Attorney General overvote. B-0032, item on the back. Uh, for Secretary of State, we have an unbubbled write-in. Okay, an unbubbled write-in isn't a vote if there's another vote in the race. But a write-in for a candidate in the race isn't a write-in, it's a vote for the candidate. So Dale Whitaker is a printed candidate. So Dale Whitaker, like if, if there wasn't this happening or the strikeout, Dale Whitaker would get the vote. Uh, is this a vote for Damon? Ignoring the unbubbled write-in. Or is it an overvote for Dale, Dale and Damon? because the write-in turns into a vote for Dale. Does the fact that Dale uh, was already corrected away have any bearing on the situation at all? Uh, both John and I agree. I don't know if he's here. We haven't seen this one before. <laughs> John's been doing this a long time. This is like I've been a, doing it for a long time now, too. This is like a logic problem on this yes, it house. <laughs> it's like, is not marked for, for the right. For the right. For race, this voter marked a candidate and then marked the write-in bubble and copied the party preference of that candidate that they marked. Can we call this a pattern of similar marks per Rule B and give them their non-write-in votes? Rule B is generally used for uh, votes used to vote with marks outside the oval, so this would be another one of those interesting, not interesting, um, would be a not as regular use of So instead of like what looks like they need a voter signature, they're using the party preference of the vote of the candidate they voted for. Is it the second ballot? Yeah. And it's so consistent. I would just cut John's vote. Yeah. 
Yeah, they just, they just really wanted us to know what the preference was. Board has determined a vote for Senator Garcia, Congressional District Number Seven, Alexander, Governor Hanson, Lieutenant Governor Matthews, Secretary of State Tiggs, State Treasurer Hannick, Auditor McCarthy, Attorney General Serrano. Public Lands, Butler, Insurance Commissioner, Hendricks, Ledge 32, Position 1, Cindy Rue, Ledge 32, Position 2, Davis, State Supreme Court, Position 2, Bloom, normal filled out one, but he already had it figured out. But. And that is all the ballots I have to present to you today. <laughs> Goodness, that was exhausting. Thank you very much, Chairman and team, for bringing those forward. Uh, we need a motion. I make a motion for the King County election staff to count the ballots as marked. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Is there any other further business? Not today. <laughs> Fabulous. This canvassing board is officially adjourned at 342 on August 15th, 2024. Thanks everyone.